I hate to be that guy, but Bonnie is starting to fill out all the spaces on the new Straw Hat crewmate bingo board. She is coming startlingly close. Tragic backstory, a dream for the future, and no real home to go back to or desire to stay put anywhere at all, really. She is a perfect candidate for piracy. And Bonnie fits in really well with the crew dynamic. The Straw Hats are already kind of set up as your classic family. As soon as Nami finds out Bonnie's true age, she's going to get extremely protective and motherly of her. And meanwhile, Jinbei has already proven himself to be an adequate fatherly figure when he supervised Luffy, Bonnie, and Chopper having fun on Egghead Island. And I can imagine Bonnie and Luffy being like bickering siblings fighting over food. And when I say fighting, I mean very literally and with very giant fists from both of them. At the same time though, Bonnie as a straw hat, I don't know, it doesn't feel quite right yet. I still don't quite feel that drive that she needs to be part of the crew like I did with everyone else. Although I would also ask the question of, who else would she go with? I don't think that Bonnie can roam the world alone again. She's an OP 12 year old, but a 12 year old nonetheless, and needs some sort of guardian or guiding figure. One option I could see is Bonnie staying with Vegapunk, wherever he slash they end up. That or maybe even taking up residence with the Revolutionary Army, following in her father's footsteps and everything. Everything. Or maybe Bonnie's just gonna be another Kinemon and she's gonna sail with us for the next uh, decade or so, but not actually join the crew. I think it's nearly impossible for Johnny to, <laughs> Johnny. I think it's nearly impossible for Bonnie to join the crew. That said, she will join. What, what do you mean? In Bonnie's dystopian future, where she has the Nika Nika fruit, does she technically have two devil fruits? So this is actually a pretty complicated discussion, but just to briefly address it, Bonnie in the last page isn't accessing a future where she ate Luffy's devil fruit, or at least that's not how I read into it. What I see is Bonnie accessing a distorted future where she is quite literally Nika, the original sun god before the ability was imagined into a magical fruit. At least that's how I think it needs to be logistically, I'm not, not quite sure, but Bonnie already has has one devil fruit, so if she accesses a distorted future with set fruit to eat another fruit, then surely we would have our double fruit rule coming into play and killing her instantly. Then again, to get around that, all she needs to do is not specify devil fruit. For example, in the last video, I said that she could use this fruit to become a dragon like Kaido, but that doesn't mean that Bonnie says, hey, magical fruit power of mine, I want a future with the dragon fruit. It's more than likely she says, hey, magical fruit, I want a future where I'm a literal dragon, completely unrelated to fruit. Again, it's tricky though, because for those futures to come to, pun intended, fruition, and in fact, even in the future where she has Kuma's buccaneer body, surely what she's doing is accessing an alternate reality version of herself where she was born as, say, a buccaneer or a dragon. So the distorted future ability is like ripping your future self from a different reality. In which case, maybe Bonnie can take a future version of herself who has eaten a devil fruit, because at least in that reality, she only ate one fruit. But again, I, I genuinely don't know. Bonnie's powers keep expanding in ways that make them seem nigh on limitless. And if that is the case, then apart from Blackbeard, Bonnie may very well be the only person in this world capable of multi-fruiting. In fact, why not access a distorted future where Bonnie has two fruit abilities, or three, or even four? You know what, all of them give her all of the fruit. It feels like one of those powers that really is limited only by imagination. And at the moment, I'm struggling to see why it shouldn't outright take the title of most ridiculous devil fruit away from the Nika Nika Nomi. Why didn't Bonnie know or put two and two together and think Luffy is Nika? So I was very curious about this as well, because at first I thought, oh, there's no reason why she would know. It looks obvious to us because we've just seen Luffy and Bonnie use their powers in the exact same Nika-ish sort of way. And all that Bonnie knows about Luffy is what she's read in newspapers, and they might not go into detail about his abilities. Most opponents seem very surprised and taken off guard by Luffy's rubbery nature, which says to me that him being a rubber man isn't common knowledge in the One Piece world. And then I started thinking that Egghead Island has been very convenient, because Bonnie has spent a lot of time around Luffy, but Oda always finds a way to remove her from fights. She fainted before Luffy fought Luchi, then Bonnie was spending a lot of time in Kuma's bubble memories whilst everyone else was dealing with the Seraphim, and then she got kicked away by Kizaru before Luffy pulled out anything wacky there. All of these huge moments seem to purposely remove Bonnie from the action, as if Oda was trying to obscure Luffy's abilities from her, and I'd say that it was quite brilliantly done if that statement wasn't completely false. Because one of the first things Luffy did after meeting Bonnie was stretch his arm to launch into a hologram, and then he even made a big old fist to fight Officer Kuma. So in conclusion, after this chapter specifically, I don't know why Bonnie hasn't put anything together yet, because Luffy has demonstrated all two things
clues that she knows about Nika. And another question I have is, did Kuma know that Luffy was Nika? Because Kuma saw him stretching very clearly in the Goa Kingdom. My assumption is that Kuma did know. However, he wasn't able to tell anyone, even Bonnie, out of respect for Dragon, because Luffy is his child and his weak point after all. But also if Kuma did know, then surely Bonnie would know now because she knows what he knew, his memories. She knows them. But then again, if Kuma didn't know them, why did he go to so much trouble to save Luffy? And also just how didn't he figure it out? 320 million bounty at 12 is wild. Does this make Bonnie the youngest person with such a high bounty? It's, it's pretty colossal when you think about it. Considering that a fully grown adult Robin before joining Luffy was probably more of a threat than Bonnie after Kuma's procedure, it's insane that she was only valued at 79 million berries. But I believe the record is firmly held by Charlotte Lin Lin. As a five or six year old, she was given a debut bounty of 50 million berries. And not long after that, it was raised to 500 million. And looking at these pictures, I don't think there's too big of an age difference between them. So Big Mom was probably worth half a billion before she even reached the age of 10. But what we can say is that Bonnie obliterated Kaido's personal best. He didn't even get his first bounty until he was 13. What a scrub. And get this, it was only 70 million berries. So Kaido was beaten by Big Mom, Bonnie, and Robin. Bonnie seeing the sun for the first time is such an important panel. It is, and it's something that I completely skipped over because I was more heavily invested in punching a nurse. But it's not that Bonnie has never seen the sun, it's more that she doesn't remember. The sapphire scale symptoms began when she was a toddler. So for all intents and purposes, this is the first time that she's seen the outside world. And it really adds to the last part of the chapter because after having seen the sun, Bonnie resolves never to go back to her previous life and even uses the sun as inspiration to put down Alpha by taking on the image of the sun god. And it's even got the wanky symbolic choreography of Alpha being smote down from above. But this is one reason why I can see Bonnie at least traveling with the Straw Hats, because she doesn't want to go back to her static existence. Her father promised her a world to see, and now Bonnie wants to see it all. And traveling with the Straw Hats would be a fairly good way to do that. In fact, she may even be able to see an island or two that Kuma didn't. Who knows if he ever went to Elbaf and he definitely never got to see Laugh Tail. My hot take. This flashback is literally what Bonnie saw in Kuma's memories, and we're all experiencing it with her. Yeah, but then how did he know about all the parts he wasn't there for? That's what most of us thought was going to happen. Bonnie was going to touch the bubble and that was going to be our vehicle into the Kuma flashback, which would have been a really cool new way to explore a One Piece flashback with a powerless bystander from the modern day taking a much more active and inquisitive role. As much as I like the concept, I think it would have been really difficult to pull off, or at the very least not as effective as just telling the story in this more classic traditional way. Because it's not just Kuma and Bonnie's perspectives that we're seeing. We've cut to the revolutionary army on their own, We've cut to each of the original seven warlords and even Saint Satin having some alone time in his old man chair. Alpha ripping the letters seemed personal. If she was Califa's sister and Lasky's daughter, there might be something to this. Jealousy that Bonnie and maybe even Califa had something that she never did. I kind of love this idea. So what we're saying is that Alpha is something of an unloved child and never got the attention she really needed from her father, Lasky. So when she does encounter a loving father, it cuts Alpha pretty deeply because Alpha was the neglected child and Califa was treated as the project because her raw talent was identified from an early age. And then at Cypher Pole family gatherings, everyone's always asking, oh, how's Califa doing? And then the answer's always, well, she's doing so well that I can't tell you because it's a big secret. Meanwhile, you've got Alpha sitting there in the corner just praying that no one brings up that time she blew her cover as a drunk nurse and got beaten by a nine-year-old. Also, just because I keep getting comments about this, to be clear, Alpha and Califa are two different people. Five years ago is when Califa started her mission on Water 7, which is long before Alpha was assigned to Bonnie on Sorbet. When Kuma and Rayleigh were talking telepathically on Sabadi, wasn't that a version of observation hockey? All right, this might seem like a bit of a weird question, and there's, there's a lot of assumptions happening here, but it touches on something that I've been thinking about for quite a while. But the weird thing is that telepathy does seem to legitimately exist in the One Piece world. And we even have a very blatant example of it in this chapter. Whilst Alpha is feeding Bonnie her, quote, medicine, Gyogyo and Connie are speaking to each other telepathically through thought bubbles. Gyogyo asks why they're hiding Bonnie's powers and Connie delivers the answer straight into his mind brain. Now, one theory is that this is how Oda implies that characters are whispering to one another, which would be great, except in the panel right next to it, you have Alpha using the exact same bubble device, but it 
represents a private thought because she's all giddy about feeding Bonnie a horrid lemon flavored placebo. Also, this goes much deeper than I thought it did because this is a device that Oda has been using for quite a long time now. And it almost exclusively pops up in cases where characters can't freely communicate, such as the Udon prison, where Luffy and Hyogoro couldn't speak freely due to the guards around them. So Hyogoro did the classic telepathy bubble. However, there's, there's a problem here because a lot of you probably know this, but Oda has a very specific rule when it comes to writing Luffy, which is that we never see his thoughts. The idea is that Luffy is so simple to the point where if he's thinking something, he's probably already saying it anyway. And so when Hyogoro attempts to speak to Luffy through a thought bubble, what Luffy does is use his Conqueror's Haki to knock out the guards because he can't reply with a thought bubble, as that would of course break the Luffy rule. So he knocks out the guards and then proceeds to speak at his regular volume. But look, Oda isn't perfect, and there are a handful of very rare circumstances when the Luffy rule has been broken. Most notably in Impel Down, after Hancock smuggles Luffy in and he says thank you in bubble form, which Hancock mishears slash misinterprets as I love you. And you'd think the anime would have the answer to the question of exactly what's going on here, but it doesn't. In fact, the anime chooses not to deal with this at all. For example, in that same scene of Udon, they have Hyogoro just speaking at regular volume. They ignore it completely. So the sort of telepathic slash I guess whisper conversations are a purely manga phenomenon. What baffles me is that a lot of people seem to blame Dragon here because quote, he is just making excuses. I'd like to remind everyone of what the WG did when they found out Roger had a son. I think that's very fair. Nobody is more aware of what the world government will do to the spawn of prominent criminals than Dragon, or Garp, or the entire world, because of that one time where the Marines publicly killed, quote, anybody who looks suspicious, and in this case, what suspicious meant was baby or pregnant woman. And Kuma is another example. Saint Satin finding out about Kuma's child and her condition quite literally put Kuma under his control. So that line in the chapter about a child being the parent's weak spot isn't wrong at all. So I get it, and I think it's more than fair that Dragon has kept his distance from Luffy, but again, that's assumedly due to his choices. I think it was put best by one of our amazing Grand Fleet members. His name is Brandon, and he said that Dragon was a bad dad with good intentions. He went out for milk and cigarettes, but never came back because he found himself caught up in dismantling an authoritarian dictatorship, you know, the classic trope. But I am very keen to find out when Luffy fits into all of this, because the Revolutionary Army itself is actually older than Luffy, or the Freedom Fighters are at the very least. They existed at least 22 years ago during the O'Hara incident, whilst Luffy is only 19. So early on in his quest for global revolution, Dragon decided, you know, let, let's procreate. Nothing could go wrong there. But then he realized that, oh no, my child, the child of one of the world's most wanted criminals probably isn't going to have the easiest life. I've got nothing to say. I'm just here to be milked for content. Milk me. Very well, sir. Consider yourself thoroughly milked. Seeing 10 year old Bonnie using Luffy's gear third took me back to when Luffy used gear third for the first time and turned into a kid. You know, these days I often completely forget that that was ever a thing. It feels like it's been so long. And I really liked that drawback because it made when and when not to use gear third a very strategic decision. Almost like you needed to do it in a position of certain victory because otherwise it would almost certainly lead to defeat. And part of that is why I love gear fifth so much because I miss when really weird things would happen to Luffy due to his ludicrous powers. And for the early post times skip era, we went through a bit of an edgy teenage phase where Luffy's transformations kept getting cooler, sleeker, and stronger. So I'm really glad that Wano eventually put us back on the wacky track. The reason Kuma sent Luffy to Amazon Lily is because he saw him training in the jungle now. All right, so everyone else makes sense. Eat Straw Hack got sent to the exact perfect destination designed to enhance their skills, which firstly, in retrospect, means that Kuma must have been really keeping up with Straw Hat news and gossip to simply know each crew member on this level. But why Amazon Lily? I think it's a cool idea that Kuma knew that Rusukaina was nearby, which was an amped up version of Luffy's Dawn Island training, but that was Ray Lee's idea, not Kuma's. And the two of them didn't have any time to discuss or make plans either. So what was it about Amazon Lily or Boa Hancock that Kuma just knew that this was the right spot for Luffy? It still feels like we're missing that one bit of connective tissue there. Also in retrospect, it seems just a little bit harsh that he sent Robin to Tequila Wolf to become a bridge slave. Even if he knew the Revolutionary Army were about to raid it, couldn't he just have sent her to, you know, a safe revolutionary army base. 
No, slavery for you. Based on how the chapter ends, I'm assuming 1101 was the end of Kuma's backstory. The narration at the end definitely gives you that kind of wrap up vibe. And then Bonnie went on to become an infamous pirate and you all know the story from there the end. So I could see the next chapter having a couple of flashback pages and then transitioning right back into modern day, but it depends if Oda has much more that he wants to show us with Kuma. One thing we haven't seen is that moment of full conversion, which happened between Sabadi and the Paramount War. And given how thorough Oda's been with torturing Kuma over the last couple of months, it would be very on point for him to continue to do so right up until the last second of his consciousness. There also might be an opportunity to twist the knife in one last time by showing both Kuma and Bonnie on Sabadi. Kuma might even know that she's there, but has to honor his deal about not contacting her. For the most part though, I feel like we have a very complete picture of both Kuma and Bonnie, and no matter how 2023 ends, we are in for an explosive art climax in early 2024.